There are two major systems of classification of mental disorders, a dimensional approach and a discrete or categorical approach. The discrete approach takes a yes or no approach. That is, based on the symptoms identified, you either, let's say, have schizophrenia or you don't. The disorders are categorised based on the symptoms identified and the characteristics. Diagnosis involves a comparison of patients' symptoms to the listed symptoms in, let's say, the DSM, for example. The classification needs to be valid, i.e. the symptoms need to match the disorder identified in the manual, and it needs to be reliable, so that when we come up with a list of symptoms, they'll be consistently, will consistently come up with the same diagnosis. The DSM, Diagnostic Statistical Manual, uses a categorical approach to classify mental disorders based on the conditions identified. There are 16 major categories in the DSM-4, subdivided into 365 specific disorders. An example of one of the 16 groups of disorders is impulse control disorder, which can be defined as failure to resist an impulsive act or behaviour that may be harmful to yourself or others, such as violent behaviour, sexual behaviour, gambling, pyromania, kleptomania, etc., with a bunch of different disorders under this category. For instance, trichotillomania, all right, failure to resist the urge to pull out hairs from all sorts of parts of your body. The DSM provides information on possible causes of a mental disorder, age of likely occurrence, which is particularly pertinent for developmental disorders such as autism, Asperger's, etc. Genetic predisposition, so for instance, if you have two parents who have been clinically diagnosed as with schizophrenia, then that dramatically increases the odds of their offspring having schizophrenia. How common? Well, the most common mental conditions are anxiety disorders affecting up to 25% of the population. Course of the disorder, i.e. the age when they're most likely to grow out of it, particularly for like I said before, developmental disorders. Inclusion criteria, so symptoms that must be present for diagnosis. Exclusion criteria. The reason why we have exclusion criteria is to prevent or minimise overlap. So, for instance, when we have symptoms such as symptoms of anxiety and there are, say, hallucinatory symptoms that accompany that, then we move into the psychotic disorder category. And then we have polythetic criteria. So for polythetic criteria, we only need some of the symptoms for a diagnosis. So for example, narcissism, we only need five of these nine categories in order for to be diagnosed as being narcissistic. Strengths of the Categorical approach, well, it provides more detail of the actual disorder in terms of symptoms, cause, the likely cause of the disorder, etc. Provides more user-friendly guidelines for the actual treatment of the disorder. And the mental health clinicians are in a better position to gather information about the disorder and thus communicate with their peers. Limitations of the categorical approach, we're more likely to have labelling as opposed to a dimensional approach which can stigmatise the patient, i.e. they might be labelled as having a psychotic disorder where people are going to be wary of them, treat them differently, stigmatise them, etc. There is a high degree of overlap between symptoms of different disorders, different classifications of disorders, whether they be mood, anxiety, psychotic, developmental, etc. And there's a lower level of information provided on a case-by-case -case format as opposed to a dimensional approach, which I'll talk about in a future clip. Now, when a mental health clinician adopts the categorical approach, specifically the use of the DSM-IV, 
They use a multi-axial approach, which provides a more comprehensive evaluation of the client's functioning by going through these five axes. So we start off with axis one. Does the patient have a clinical disorder that's not covered by axis two, which we'll get to shortly? A key aspect of axis one is that these disorders are generally only present for part of the person's life, not all. And then we get to axis two. Does the patient have a personality or intellectual disorder? And a key aspect of axis two is this disorder is part of the person's life. It's part of who they are. So basically, they will always have the disorder. Axis three. We look at if there is a medical or physical condition that has contributed to the disorder, such as a significant injury, a diagnosis of cancer, etc. Then we get to axis four. Are there any psychosocial or environmental factors that have contributed to the disorder, such as marriage breakup, death of a loved one, job loss, etc.? And finally, we use the global assessment of functioning based on the person's social, occupational and psychological level of functioning. And then over time, we can benchmark this to determine the success of treatment.